Across America, BP supports more than 275,000 jobs to keep energy flowing. Jobs like building grid-scale solar energy in Ohio and producing gas with fewer operational emissions in Texas. It's and, not or. See what doing both means for energy nationwide at bp.com slash investing in America. The stress and crowds of holiday shopping can put a damper on your holiday spirit, and you don't always find all the perfect gifts you're looking for. The Virginia Lottery's games make easy and tremendously fun gifts for all the adults in your life, even you. Spruce up your gift-giving game this holiday season with the Virginia Lottery. The Virginia Lottery's holiday scratchers are a gift any adult will love. Treat yourself to some winter wonderment and play the Lottery's holiday online instant games from anywhere in Virginia. Visit valottery.com slash holiday. Please gift responsibly. Lottery games are not for minors. Hey, it's Ryan Holiday, host of the Daily Stoic Podcast. When I bought my first house in 2013, part of the way I paid for it was we would rent it out on Airbnb in Austin when there was South by Southwest or F1 or ACL. And then later when that tiny little house became my office, I would work there, I'd do my writing during the week. Then on the weekends, we'd rent it out to people who were coming in from out of town on Airbnb. And you may be sitting on an Airbnb and not even know it. You've probably had the same experience. You stayed in an Airbnb and thought, this is doable. Maybe I could rent my place on Airbnb. And it's really that simple. You can start with a spare room or you can rent your whole place. Maybe you're traveling to see friends and family for the holidays. While you're away, your home could be an Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out at airbnb.com slash host. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of the murder of two girls. So we're going to be very transparent here and tell you right at the outset that this is an episode we have struggled with. We have struggled both in how to tell the story. We've struggled with when to tell the story. We've struggled with how much of the story we should tell now or at any time. We've even recorded a number of other versions of this episode. We won't be releasing those. We've really tried to get this right while minimizing harm, but ensuring that the public is aware of what's going on here. Because we think it's an important story and there's information here that the public should frankly be aware of. We're going to tell the story as best we can, but certainly there are things we're not telling just now. But I think we can expect more details to come out later, both from us and other sources. One reason we want to speak out now is because we feel like there's a lot of very inaccurate speculation going on out there about the upcoming hearing in the Delphi murders case and just about everything else, as usual. But suffice to say that what is really going on here is that there has been a catastrophic leak of crime scene photos in this case. And we've pieced together how it happened. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is The Delphi Murders, Leaked Crime Scene Photographs. This is an episode that basically is about leaks. And so I feel it's very, very important here at the outset before we even get started to be transparent about our methods and process in putting together this particular episode. None of the information we're going to share with you in this came from the following parties. Law enforcement, the prosecution, the defense, court staff. 
no one leaked this information to us that we're going to share. When we piece together this story, we mean literally we pieced it together. We went out and we did shoe leather journalism. We talked to a ton of people who had different levels of involvement in this case because they were part of the leak or had received the leak. And we reviewed screenshots and other documentation corroborating social media posts, social media accounts. That is how we put this together. And it's essentially a bizarre situation where normally the people who are either creators who cover the Delphi case or online commentators, people who follow the case, they're the ones seeking out information. In this case, they form the basis of this story. Yes. They've become the news. So to start from almost the beginning, I suppose, in early October, a photograph of a tree with some sort of markings on it was released. Um, it was purported to be from the Delphi murders crime scene and to have Liberty Germans blood on it. You probably saw this picture. It was pretty widely circulated on social media. We did not allow this picture to be posted in our group for a couple of reasons. First of all, quite simply, we had no way of verifying whether or not it was an accurate picture. In other words, we didn't know for sure if it depicted what it was said to depict, because since a description of this alleged symbol in the tree had been published in the Franks Memorandum, it wouldn't be that difficult for someone to go in their backyard and fake it. That was reason number one. So reason number two is, if it is true, if this picture of the tree with this symbol on it is accurate and is part of the crime scene, then this tree shows the blood of a murdered child. And it's a murdered child that we care about and whose case we care about. And we felt that it would be disrespectful to share such an image in our group. And we know the families in this case follow social media happenings. Uh, we did not want our group to be a place where they would see something so awful. And it just, it and frankly, we were disturbed. I mean, I think we were pretty skeptical about it at first, actually, but the off chance that it was a leak that chilled us. So things changed a bit for us in the early morning hours of October 5th, 2023. That is when a source sent us graphic crime scene photos of the Delphi case. Now, I'm not going to give more detail than that. You can use your imagination. I don't think it's appropriate for a number of reasons to give more detail detail than that because i respect these girls i respect the case we respect their families with and know that they've been through enough we will not be to be clear we will not be talking about these photos in any more detail than in this episode we will not be sharing details we will not be sharing our interpretations we will not be verifying whatever anyone else who wants to go and say about them we will we think it shows really bad judgment to do so, and we will not be participating in that. Needless to say, what what I will repeat what I said. They were, were graphic crime scene photos, and it was immediately obvious when we saw these photos that they were authentic. In other words, they actually did come from the crime scene. So that was obviously disturbing. When the sun rose... That morning, we called law enforcement to let them know there had been this massive leak of crime scene photos because you have to understand this material has been kept under wraps. And if it's getting out, that means there is a massive breach somewhere in the system that needs to be sealed in order to protect the case, protect the families. And so, actually, not only did we reach out to law enforcement, but I, that day we also reached out to the defense team to make sure they knew that there had been a leak. Yeah. We, at that point, I want to be very clear, we had no idea where this leak was coming from. So, we wanted, we felt it was prudent to alert both sides of the issue that this was going on so that everyone could be informed. And uh, shortly thereafter, the person who sent the, the images to us, First of all, I want to say this is a good person. 
They wanted to do the right thing. They wanted to help plug the leak. In other words, the person who sent them to us was not the person who took these photos from Discovery or from wherever and sent them out. This was a person who also had received the images from someone. And this person asked us to help plug the leak and to provide whatever information we could to authorities. Which we proceeded to do so immediately, filling them in on what we'd been told, what, you know, everything. You may be wondering, why exactly is a leak like this so bad? And there are a couple of different answers to that, a couple of different facets that makes this such an incredibly prominent and problematic issue. One, these are graphic photos by nature, by their very nature, they are incendiary. Um, The publication and dissemination of these photos could hypothetically endanger Richard Allen's right to a fair trial. And from a purely moral standpoint, spreading these pictures, publishing these pictures. Talking about these pictures in detail. It's all incredibly disrespectful to the families. And keep in mind the way the internet works. If someone as much as shows these pictures on a YouTube live for a second, someone's going to freeze frame them. And that means... They live forever on the internet. They live forever on the internet. That means forever after the families of Abby and Libby and everybody who cares about Abby and Libby has to face the possibility that when they go to check their Facebook or do anything online, they might find these pictures looking back at them. It's one thing to show these in court to a jury. Or experts who are going to be providing statements and and witness testimony. But in in the court situation, the pictures aren't going to be copied and put on the internet. They're going to be shown to the jury and then taken down. And so sharing these pictures is incredibly disrespectful to the families, in addition to harming the case. And just to add to that quickly, Kevin and I are both very curious people. We want to know things. We want to we want to know about a case that we're looking into. We understand the need for curiosity. We understand that a lot of people don't mean harm when they're being curious. But we have to differentiate between curiosity that's okay and then curiosity that's incredibly intrusive and puts itself above all other concerns. And I would say that this kind of curiosity falls into that. So if you're just listening and saying, where can I get these? Just consider how you would feel if an army of online strangers were salivating over pictures of a graphic crime scene involving your child. Yeah. Just think about that for a minute and how that would feel. And also, let's not be judgmental, too judgmental of the people who may be sharing them, because we are curious people. And I think we all have that temptation inside of us to want to see things. Yeah, that's true. So let's let's show some grace. Yes, let's to not each other. let's not condemn people necessarily. Let's condemn behavior, but not condemn people, and give people an opportunity to kind of think about things and perhaps do something different. And if you just have these pictures, you're not in trouble. No, just tell law enforcement, cooperate with law enforcement, and help fix the problem. And when when you're done doing that. Delete them and don't share them. And if you've already shared them, encourage others to cooperate, encourage others to delete. Let's just work together, perhaps, for once to actually put the girls first. We all say everyone who covers Delphi says a lot. We care about Abby and Libby. We care about their families. And to me, talk at the end of the day is incredibly cheap. I feel like we need to show them that we care by internally dealing with this situation ourselves. Before we leave leave this particular uh, sub-area of this discussion, I want to make the point, I've seen different people online who have seen these pictures, and they're saying, well, what I saw in the pictures proves this particular theory, or what I saw in the pictures disproves this particular theory. And the thing to keep in mind is none of us are experts. The only people who can look at one or two isolated pictures and come up with some grand conclusions are either Sherlock Holmes. None of us are Sherlock Holmes. Doesn't exist. He's fictional. Or experts, people who aren't people who aren't just people who have read about things online. People who've actually gone to school for these things and looked at other crime scene pictures of other crimes, visited crime scenes, and know what all of these things mean. 
And let me add to that. If you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm an expert in something specific relevant to this, I would say, okay, that's great. But having a, a group of photos removed from any context and removed from any additional files that could provide context is essentially meaningless. So any real expert, any true person who is trying to do their best to be an expert would be considering that and saying, well, I can't speak on something because all I have is a small fragment of information out of the huge, huge iceberg of information that's beneath the surface within the case files. For our purposes, for Kevin and I personally, we will not be discussing, describing, verifying anything about what we've seen. Please do not waste our time by asking us. Don't waste your time. It's just not something we feel good about doing. We do not feel good about exploiting what awful things we've seen. So when we called law enforcement and when we alerted the defense, we did not know the ultimate source of these leaks. As you were here shortly, that would eventually change. At the murder sheet, we spend so much time digging into crime stories that sometimes it's difficult to find the time to plan out and cook elaborate, nutritious meals. That's why we are so excited about our sponsor, Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. Our sponsors make this podcast possible. So if you go to factormeals.com slash msheet and use our special code msheet, you're not just getting half off this high-quality meal plan. You're supporting us, too. So I'm obsessed with Factor. I had their creamed corn chicken and their tomato basil chicken risotto recently. Both were delicious. That risotto in particular was amazing. Plus, the whole process was a breeze. All I had to do was pop the meal into the microwave. The food was tasty and flavorful, which is no surprise given that each recipe is specifically crafted by chefs and approved by dietitians. Having Factor during the hectic holiday season has been a boon, especially with us pumping out so many episodes. Head to factormeals.com slash msheet and use code msheet to get 50% off. That's code msheet at factormeals.com slash msheet to get 50% off. Have you heard? You can listen to your gripping investigations ad-free. Good news. With Amazon Music, you have access to the largest catalog of ad-free top podcasts included with your Prime membership. To start listening, download the Amazon Music app or visit amazon.com slash true crime ad free. That's amazon.com slash true crime ad free and catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Imagine all your audio entertainment available in just one place. That's what the Audible app is all about. With Audible, you can always find the best of what you love or discover something new. Audible has an incredible selection of mystery and thriller titles and originals, like Something Ain't Right by Roger Stringer and Zachary Stringer, The Space Within by Greg O'Connor and Josh Fagan, and the Audible original Moriarty. Membership includes access to Audible originals, podcasts, and tons of audiobooks that you can download or stream as much as you want. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month from an ever-growing catalog of titles to keep. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, whether you're traveling, working out, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. New members can try Audible now free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash thrill or text thrill to 500-500. That's audible.com slash thrill or text thrill to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. Now, I want to say that the law enforcement official who was tasked with this investigation was a name uh, many of you were recognized. It was Jerry Holman of the Indiana State Police. And frankly, we were impressed with his professionalism and open-mindedness on this. He took very seriously the possibility that this leak could have come from inside law enforcement. And that is something that frankly seemed to spur him on to work even harder to find out who was responsible because his attitude seemed to be if, if this was done by someone in law enforcement, that person needs to be out of law enforcement. If they're bad apples, we need to get rid of them. 
And I just, I just thought it was important to make those observations because we all are used to watching these investigations from the outside. So when we got the opportunity to actually be a small part of an investigation such as this, we were impressed with what we saw. I want to stress that our communications with Sergeant Holman were entirely a one-way street. Again, he was not giving us information. We were giving him information. We did not want in any way to exploit the fact that we had received images that we never should have received in order to get something or get quid pro quo or get information. For, we we treated our role in this as essentially people who had witnessed a crime. We're going to give you our information and then back off. I think some people seem to take this as I'm going to rush to a camera and try to raise money off of this or something like that. And that that's frankly appalling. So let's get back to talking about our source, the person who sent these pictures to us. I cannot stress enough that this is a good person. This person felt bad about having anything at all to do with the leak or the dissemination of these materials. In fact, we were the only people who received them from this particular source. This source very early on made the determination to want to do everything they could to fix this situation. In other words, they want to do the mature and right thing. And so the way to do that in the source's judgment was to to provide us with screenshots of all of the back and forth between the source and the person who provided the images to the source. And our source provided the screenshots to us with one condition, namely that we turn them over to law enforcement. Which we agreed to do. As we reviewed the communications between our source and this person, we also began hearing from others in the community who had received these images. And it soon became quite clear which side of the fence was responsible for this leak. And we're going to get into that in a second. When you start talking about things, sometimes it becomes a bit confusing. We don't want to name the person who passed along the images to our source. Uh, There's a reason for that, which I'm sure we will get to at some point, but that person we are going to refer to as R. Some background on R. He was a regular participant in at least one Delphi focused Facebook group where he regularly made comments and arguments that Kevin and I would describe as defense-friendly without being necessarily overtly so. In his private messages with our source, R also shared uh, an enormous amount of inside information about the defense team and their activities. R shared details about the defense team's investigation and strategies and things they'd uncovered. And these are things that have not been made public, but which appear to be accurate. Yes, from our own reporting. He also claimed to have spent time going through the defense's discovery materials at the invitation of the defense team. Now, that's an alarming claim, but we need to note, we have no way of evaluating the accuracy of that. When we looked at ours Facebook page, we saw that he was friends with someone whose name we recognized. Again, we're not going to share that name at this time. We refer to this individual as M. M is a former employee of the criminal defense team, Andrew Baldwin's law firm, and someone we know to be close to Attorney Baldwin. In the messages between our source and R, R appeared to be highly frustrated by the illustration of the alleged symbol on the tree that had been shared on court TV. This illustration, which truly to anyone observing, looked more like splatter than the shape of an F, per se, appeared to us to have potentially inspired him to share the image of the bloody tree. Essentially, he was trying to refute the court TV illustration. Because the implication was the court TV illustration was bad for the defense and seemed in some way to go against the Odinism theory, and getting this picture out there would, in some way correct the record in their mind, and be supportive of the Odinism theory. Now, 
All we know is what we can interpret from our statements. So we don't know what was in his heart, but this is just our interpretation based on the tenor of the conversations, both public and private, that we witnessed this person have. Through the screenshots. Through the screenshots and through our own research online. Now, from speaking with others, we also know that R did not simply leak the images just to our source. R leaked these images at the very least to one other person, and there's possibly others out there that we don't even know about. Suffice to say that in a very short amount of time, these images were spreading around widely. So on October 9th, 2023, we sat down for a formal interview with Sergeant Holman. We passed along to him all the materials we'd received from our source, and we made a formal statement. We also at that time deleted the images from the crime scene from our phones. We had only held on to them that long because we did not want to destroy evidence. But at this interview, we took our phones out and deleted them. So it is important, again, I know we're repeating ourselves. It is very important if you have these images, you are not in trouble. Report it to law enforcement. Delete the images. Don't share them with others. Don't go online and talk about them. Don't gossip about them with your friends. None of us were ever meant to have or see these. And it does not help the case. It does not help the defendant's rights. It does not help the memory of the victims for us to be trying to exploit this improper access that we all had in order to make a point, win an argument, get some clicks. It's just not appropriate. It's heinous. And let's show grace to one another in this. Let's not be overly judgmental of people who may have these images or who may even have shared them with one person. Let's just take this as an opportunity to encourage those people to do the right thing. Sometimes it's hard to remember what the right thing is or to even know what the right thing to do is. Especially in a case like Delphi, everybody has spent years trying to get more information, running after tips, running after comments on social media. We want to know, and we understand that. And so if a person in a moment without really thinking of the consequences shared it with a friend or something, don't be judgmental. Just let's encourage that person to now do the right thing. And I don't they, think and shame do- and blame help here. I think I think understanding and saying, let's all stop what we're doing, think about it, do the right thing. I think that is going to that is what is going to help people move forward with this. And this never should have happened. But ultimately, if we can just find a way to come together and do the right thing as a collective, that's showing the girls, everyone who cared about the girls, that we care too. That we care enough to protect this case and protect protect their memories. So we're talking a lot about how we as a community should be reacting to this and what we as a community should be doing. Let's shift our conversation over to the defense team. The fact that a breach of this extreme magnitude occurred on the defense team's watch is an extraordinarily serious matter. I cannot overstate how serious this is. Now, we have no inside knowledge, but we feel that based on everything we know, it is crystal clear that this leak and its consequences are going to be the focus of the upcoming hearing. Keep in mind that there was a protective order on the discovery in this case. So what that means is that the defense agreed to ensure that they only shared the discovery with trustworthy associates, either expert witnesses or support staff, who signed paperwork affirming that they wouldn't leak anything on the penalty of contempt of court charges. And those were supposed to also be approved with the court. There was supposed to be a process for this. Now, Judge Fran Gull has numerous options as to how she can respond and deal with this at this upcoming hearing. On one extreme, she can just tell the defense attorneys, well, do better next time. On the other extreme, given the fact that these men were appointed by the court, 
she would be within her rights to remove Brad Rosie and Andrew Baldwin from this case. Experts we have spoken with on background, experts who, again, are in no way affiliated with this case, have indicated to us that they feel there is indeed a very real possibility of Rosie and Baldwin being removed from this case at the upcoming hearing. So what you just heard was recorded yesterday, Friday. Uh, we'd hoped we could wait to release it until Monday. We also very much hope that a few of the details we chose to hold back could also remain private, at least for a while. But some very distorted versions of a few things have started to come out on social media, and we think it is incredibly important that we tell you the truth about those things. Our source's name is Mark. Again, we need to reiterate, he was sent these images by a man we're calling R. At one point, R donated some money to a fundraiser for Mark's child. Despite what you may have heard, that was not a payment for the pictures. It was R who got the pictures through his connections to the defense team. It was R who shared them with Mark. We feel that R's donation was just trying to be nice to a guy he met on the internet. Another fact we were actually incredibly reluctant to share is that R died by suicide last week. He was a young man with a wife and family. You never really can know what's in another person's heart or mind, and therefore, not knowing that, we, we, we hesitate to draw any conclusions about what happened to R. Needless to say, this is an incredible tragedy. And a family is left reeling and devastated by this whole situation, this whole horrible situation. And again, we don't know this individual. We never we never reached out to R. We never spoke with R. But it's very possible that other situations were happening that just none of us know about. But it's it's just such an awful and tragic outcome. Irresponsible people are speculating that R may actually have been murdered as part of a cover-up. Please, 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 please don't engage in such stupid talk, at least not now. And please, please do not share his name if you know it. Please, please let his family grieve in peace and let them bury their dead. Think about how you would feel if your family was thrust into a situation like this. And please act accordingly because the lack of compassion sometimes and empathy in this community is striking and it's noticed. And we're just asking people who follow this case to perhaps for once come together, act with some tact, act with some understanding, because his family does not deserve what happened. He didn't deserve what happened. This whole situation is just a disaster. And the least we can do amongst people who follow this case is to just back off for once and let them grieve. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. 
We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.